and our minds. Gracious God, you come among your people as one who fashioned all things. Who face to face revealed your knowledge of our lives and whose presence brings assurance and hope. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, so that in hearing and seeing the gifts of this life, we may know the way to live in thanksgiving. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
like to see Mark Dunning. He is an uh, elder at a pastor at uh, Brighton Presbyterian Church. A church that's familiar to me. I worked in Williamson County for 25 years or so. And I've actually been to this church in Yellow, but one of my best friends out there is a uh, member of that church. And I apologize for not introducing you so <laughs> And now the call to confession. Let us call the name of the one who invites us to speak the truth about ourselves and our relationships and promises to show us mercy. Spirit of God, we hesitate now. You call us to act boldly. For our fear, Jesus, from following in your call. Forgive our lack of courage. Embolden us. how you feel there. Maybe you feel a little bit of alone for a few minutes there until you see somebody you recognize. Now I want you to think on the other side. Think about a birthday party. You ever been to a birthday party lately? And all your friends are there. Maybe it's yours or somebody else's. And everybody's yelling and screaming. And what do you sing at a birthday party? Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Stay with me on this. <laughs> right? When you sing happy birthday, you want your friends to sing loud? Yeah, of course you sing loud, because you're happy. Because you know what I like about birthday parties? Because even if it's not your birthday, sometimes you get a bag of presents too, right? Isn't that fun? And you're all excited, it makes you feel good, and you're happy, right? It's like Christmas morning, you're happy, right? Do you know that both when you go into that place when maybe you have a little bit of fear, you're a little uncomfortable, and when you go to a birthday party and you'll feel great, that there's one thing in common there. That's the Holy Spirit. You hear adults, right, at this church sometime, you hear them sing or say, Holy Spirit. 
You ever wonder what that is? Because if you know, please share with me. God, that's exactly what it is. That's exactly what the Holy Spirit is. You see, today is Pentecost Sunday. And on this Sunday, years and years ago, after Jesus was crucified and he rose again, the apostles and Mary were sitting there and they're wondering, what are we going to do now because Jesus is gone? Here's this wonderful person who came, and he was gone. And they didn't know what they were going to do. And you know what? They felt like they walked into a place where they didn't know anybody. And on that day, the Holy Spirit came down. The Holy Spirit said to everybody present that I'm your friend. I'm with you when you're sad, and I'm with you when you're happy, and when you're celebrating with your family and your friends, or if you're walking down a path by yourself at night and it's a little scary. I'm with you both times. Because Jesus is always with us. And God wants us to know whether you're happy or sad, it's okay. Because he's with you. You always have a friend walking with you. Make sense? Great. Let's say a little prayer. Gracious Father, thank you for always being with us. For sending the Holy Spirit to let us know you are there. You did not leave us alone. So when we're happy, when we're singing, when we're dancing, when we're sad, for whatever reason, we know you are there because your presence is always with us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, guys, for coming up here with me. Appreciate it.
Thank you. That was uh, so awesome when you get to share your gifts and see those gifts. Well, friends, it's great to be back. As I mentioned before, we're very excited, and I grab my glasses or we'll have no idea where. <laughs> Friends, we're going to do our scripture readings today, and I'm going to do it a little bit of backward order because our Old Testament lesson is going to be part of the message we shared this morning. So our New Testament lesson comes in Acts. It comes just after they've been visited by the Holy Spirit, but it's a, a section of the story that I think is so important. So it's Acts chapter 2, um, verse 36 will begin through 41. Sometimes this verse doesn't always get read as we're talking about Pentecost Sunday, but I think you'll find it uh, very meaningful. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sin. You will see the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accept his message were baptized, and about 3,000 members were added to that church on that very day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, it's, it's great to be here and with you on this Pentecost Sunday. Of course, the celebration where the Holy Spirit, as I shared with the kids, descended down to Mary and the apostles as they had gathered to celebrate the Jewish festival of the early harvest some 50 days after Christ's resurrection. As told in Acts, previous to the verses I read, the Holy Spirit descended on them, all who was present. See, it wasn't just Christians there. They had gathered in Jerusalem for this large festival that happened every year. It was really called the early harvest. They celebrated it in the spring and then again in the fall. And the Spirit descended on them and brought them together, uniting in one message that multiple voices and it drew together all who could hear and understand the message being delivered. And the church is said to have grown by thousands that day. Now, I'm a little skeptical that our message I was telling Ray today will have the same dramatic impact to increase the size of White Lake Presbyterian Church by 3,000. But if people start filing in, just move to the middle, and we'll just extend our passing of the peace in our coffee hour. This is the Old Testament lesson. The scripture comes from Psalm 31. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame in your righteous delivery, but in your righteousness deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of my refuge for me. Be a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me and take me out of that net that is hidden for me. For you are my refuge, and into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. I will exult and rejoice in your steadfast love, because you have seen my affliction, you have taken heed with my adversities, but have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet on a broad place. Friends, this too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Father, thank you for this opportunity to share fellowship in your word in this community. We are so blessed with the understanding that you did not leave us alone, but you walk with us every day in the form of the Holy Spirit. Just to open our eyes and our hearts to see your presence on this earth. And may the words of my mouth 
the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, my rock, my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Now, Psalm 31 is a series, one of a series of psalms that are known as a penitential psalms. They're psalms of confession, if you will. They're often lifted up as a ray of hope as the psalmist, usually attributed to be David, lifts up to God an acknowledgement of sin, but also his acceptance of God's forgiveness. That's an important point, his acceptance, our acceptance of God's forgiveness. You know, the hand of the enemy can come in quite different forms for each of us. For David, it was indeed a military enemy from which he was asking God's favor, though as we know later on, David would have other enemies that he faced. For each of us, they, those enemies may come in the form of physical or emotional challenges, temptations, even thoughts. You know, recently I had a chance to spend a full day with the newest members of the First Presbyterian Church of Brighton Confirmation class. And one of the most important concepts that we talked about was not only God forgiving us, but our willingness to accept God's forgiveness. Accepting ourselves not as perfect, but as forgiven sinners, forgiven by God, that's a form of self-confidence, insurance, that God forgives us all, and by accepting that forgiveness, we can accept ourselves not only as work in progress, but as these precious children of God, children he loves, children of all ages. It was amazing to hear these kids speak on that. And the awareness, almost the relief, of a 14-year-old as they look you in the eye and say, what, I don't have to be perfect? <laughs> you think about it at their point in life. It was, it was an incredible experience. And it opened so much up for me to see that. And I very honestly went home, looked in the mirror and said, you know, you don't have to be perfect. Because that confirmation class told you so. Now that's just one of the two critical conditions, right? Just two, God asks us to to accept. One accepts his forgiveness in the form of loving him and to share our God with others in the form of loving them. Love God and love one another. Today I'd like to share with you a story of how one woman, despite enduring a lifetime of challenges that might have led many of us to either give up or at least question our faith, how she relied on her faith to get her through and how she left this legacy of faith for her children right up until the end. I really see it as a mother's gift to her children. It's really, it's really a mother's gift of faith. It starts where most stories end. You see, it was a beautiful, crisp fall Monday morning that Edna Cox passed away. Just three days short of what would have been her 84th birthday, all her children were with her, and it was, as they tend to say, a peaceful passing. She no longer suffered from the intense pain that had brought her into the hospital, unexpectedly, actually, on the Tuesday before. Now, by Friday, all her children from across the country had gathered, and the family was beyond all those tough decisions of proper care and treatments. It seems God had handled that for them. And then there was blessed with the opportunity to literally say goodbye on Saturday. And it was not a sad goodbye. She truly felt that this was one of God's blessings in her life. The many times that he showed up in her life. And she and some of those presents could feel that presence of the Holy Spirit. Of both the joy and maybe the loneliness that we talked about with the kids. It was all there. But it was strong. And they could feel that. You see, on Saturday, Edna asked all her family to come together and they gathered around. Her pain, now mostly controlled by medication, she talked of how proud she was of her family, of what a wonderful, wonderful life that she had lived. She asked everyone to join into the Lord's Prayer. And of course, being a mixture of Episcopalians and Presbyterians and some non practicing folks, Edna showing that always present sense of humor, smiled, almost giggled as the group stumbled and mumbled through the always treacherous trespasses versus debts dilemma, right? <laughs> then she requested everyone there to sing one of her favorite hymns, Amazing Grace. Of course, only she knew all the verses. Thus creating another humorous scene that she loved, where eight or nine people are kind of mumbling and humming while Edna 
sitting out seemingly totally unaware now, this had become a soul. Mostly that afternoon, she thanked God for her life. And she thanked the Holy Spirit for surrounding her in those great times of challenges and adversity, and also times of great joy and celebration. He's there both times. Eventually, Edna settled into a somewhat restless sleep as exhaustion took over, but she kept repeating over and over again, Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Now, I think to truly understand the gift she was sharing with her family that Saturday afternoon, you really need to know some of the background of that life that Edna was thanking Lord for. You see, Edna was born in a small town in southeastern Kentucky in 1932. Her family, like many of that era in the foothills, lived mostly off the land, eating what they could grow or raise or trade for, eggs and chickens and dairy products, etc. Now this was a strong Baptist Bible Belt area, a supposedly dry county, and publicly there was a clear divide of the existence of those who adhered strictly to the Bible's commandments and verses, and those who sought whatever means they could to survive. This often included making moonshine, stealing, and maybe some other less honorable means. But you see, when it comes to surviving and feeding a large family, that clear divide of right and wrong gets a little blurred, doesn't it? Maybe not unlike our faith or what can happen to some of us, maybe when we're thrown life's curves. You see, faith, too, can become a little blurred. Oh, and friends, Edna's life was full of curves. Edna's father, having spent much time working in the coal mines, passed away from tuberculosis when she was only nine years old. That triggered a cycle of life challenges and roadblocks she would encounter in her entire life. But in her heart, she held back with God, and she would say, and remember, I will be glad and rejoice in your love, for you saw my affliction. You knew the anguish of my soul. You have not given me into the hands of my enemy, but have set my feet in a spacious place. Shortly after her father died, Edna's mother and all seven kids boarded a bus to southeast Michigan. You see, this was their promised land. They were in search of a better life. The numerous manufacturing plants in Michigan at the time offered the hope of employment and food and a roof over their head. The children survived that first winter in Michigan, living either with relatives or mostly in an old farmhouse they found. <clears throat> the oldest stepson, 16, he watched the kids while Edna's mom worked about 15 miles away. She had no transportation, she walked, and she came home most weekends, sometimes. Being from Kentucky, the kids had no suitable clothing for a Michigan winter, and they struggled. But in November, the Salvation Army showed up the door with clothing and food. And in their hearts, they prayed together, I will be glad and rejoice in your love. You see, God found their affliction. He knew their anguish. And he would not give them into the hands of the enemy, cold and hunger. Thank you, God. They lasted less than a year in Michigan. Arriving back in Kentucky that summer, they found their grandmother too ill to care for the entire family, which had been Edna's mom's plan. So Edna's mom found a home for the children, the youngest children, to stay. But Edna, at age 10, was too old for that children's home. And so she would say goodbye to her siblings and return with her mother back to Michigan. Years later, that home was closed due to the misconduct of the founder for its abusive treatment of the children. It was never discussed that those children in the Cox family were subject to the abuse, but instead, they kept their faith strong. You see, they rejoiced in their love. God knew their affliction. He did not give them into the hands of the enemy this time, an abusive atmosphere. The next few years for Edna's life consisted of moving from apartment to apartment in Michigan, staying a few months with one relative, a few weeks with another, sometimes staying with neighbors they had just met and the projects they lived in. 
That is, thankfulness for strangers came to her in biblical verses. She thanked God for everyone. And occasionally, occasionally, she would live with her mother. She would be around for a few weeks and then off again. You see, having a preteen can cramp the lifestyle of a single woman looking to survive with whatever means she could. Though her role models, her mother and sometimes her aunt, were certainly sending at least mixed messages about right and wrong at a time in her life when she would have been forming a value system, Edna never followed that example. She would credit the teachings and strong Christian faith of her grandmother Pax when she was very small as being deeply embedded in her heart. And she would say, all I could do is hear verses that say, keep me from this trap that is set for me, Lord, for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. And at the age, maybe it was faith, or maybe it was fear, <laughs> fear both of God and her grandma Cox, she prayed, embrace me, Holy Spirit, that I shall trust and follow you, and you will guide me. And she would say, thank you, God. And his mother married a third time, and off they went to Bay City, again looking for work. Edna, this time with her new stepsister, were left behind with two ladies in the low-income project. Their form of survival for themselves was a lifestyle of certainly no model for young teenage girls, but they were kind, and they did care for the girls. And out of nowhere, an unexpected visit from the other grandmother, Grandmother Sila kept both girls from becoming wards of the state of Michigan. And into your hands I commit my spirit, Lord, deliver me. And he did. And then that <clears throat> followed a continuous pattern in her life, repeated itself over and over. Parents would move, and the state with relatives or whoever would take her and her sister. They would send her a bus ticket to join them. But see, that bus ticket wasn't really a gift. It meant a new school, a new opportunity to be mocked for the southern accent or the clothes she wore. There were no friends there. Often feeling alone, alone was the hardest part for Edna. Even with her mom and her stepdad, she never felt like a real family. Don't families stay together? Don't families protect each other? But in her heart, she'd remember the verses she'd memorized as a child. Keep me free from the trap that's set for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord. My faithful God. Edna would inter- return eventually to Adrian to live with relatives, Adrian in Michigan. And <clears throat> once it was made, it seemed like just another tenuous stop in that pattern. Edna chose God to thank him for these relatives. And then Edna's Pentecost. You see, while living in Adrian in one of the housing projects, Edna started attending Sunday school with the family of one of her friends. And there she met Miss Annabelle, a model of faith who, against the advice of many in her own church, started a Christian youth ministry right in this project community. And the atmosphere and the love she shared with those young kids, the youth throughout that community, that truly was the Holy Spirit at work. Thank you, God. As Edna became more and more involved in that church, her faith blossomed, and it became literally and figuratively her survival. Now, some of the teenagers eventually began to teach Sunday school, and they were all active in a youth group by a name you may remember from long ago, Christ Ambassadors. And they often would travel to other services of other assembly God churches in the area. And at that church, Edna recalls how they were not, not only accepted as equals, how the children were made to feel special by everyone, special as children of the Lord. The teenagers were loved. They were supported by all the families in this church, and many took some of those teens out of the project housing and into their own homes to live. This was such a contrast to the way they'd been treated since coming north, and it was, at this time, that Edna says she made a commitment to God to live in a way that would honor his name by living her faith to serve others. She felt worthy now to accept God's forgiveness and his love for her. 
Jesus became her guide. His message became her way of life, and the Holy Spirit her travel companion. She met and married the love of her life and had four children. It was the real family she'd always dreamed of. Uh, but those challenges weren't gone yet from Edna's life. You see, in the early 30s, Edna was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. Very little was known about RA back then, and after a series of medical tests, she was told she should prepare herself to be wheelchair bound by the time she was 40. But Edna, Edna had this enormous faith. She shares that I will be glad and rejoice in your love, because again I know you see my affliction. You knew the anguish in my soul, and you'll walk with me. You have not given me into the hands of the enemy this time, a disease we know little about that threatens her mobility. But you will set my feet in a spacious place. She began a series of experimental gold shots, which seemed to help the pain even as the disease began to infect nearly every joint in her body. As we know now, RA is really an autoimmune disease manifesting through inflammation, not through bone structure weakness. But back then, in the 60s, the treatment was focused on slowing the bone and joint deterioration. But in her late 30s, when she should have been preparing for that life in a wheelchair, she ignored that advice and still raising four children and then began a lifelong dream to attend college so she could do what she wanted most, teach children. And in 1974, Edna proudly walked in her graduation ceremony at Siena Heights College with a teaching degree in literature. And she would say as she walked down that aisle, thank you, God. The battle with RA continued, its progression and debilitation kept Edna from getting a permanent teaching position, uh, but that didn't frustrate her. You see, few institutions would hire people who walked with a bad limp and whose hands were so crippled they couldn't hold a pencil, but she built a rewarding career by going into elementary schools and tutoring kids who were found struggling with math and with reading. You see, these kids often in elementary school were made fun of because they fall behind. And they would feel like outcasts. But not to Edna. They were God's children, and He gave her this unique talent to relate to them and they to her. In the mid 1990s, she entered a battle to save her legs. The infection had incredibly mounted through her legs, and the treatments for RA, similar to oncology treatments, really lower the immune system. She again faced that challenge with prayer and faith, and sure enough, the Holy Spirit raises again. This time the reward that she runs into, she meets an incredibly young rheumatologist who's also a researcher at the University of Michigan. He would provide access and treatment and trial therapies and study Edna's disease right up until her death, using her as a laboratory that she joyfully and willingly participated in so that he could then treat others. By the way, she was never bound to a wheelchair. Thank you, God. Friends, these are just a few of the challenges that Edna faced. She captured some of these along with numerous celebrations of joy and humorous stories growing up and a book that she wrote just for her children so that we might understand the influence of her life. She called it The Shadow of the Hills. And she shared these memories as a way for her family to understand the role her faith played in her life. Always, every story focused on serving and trusting Jesus. Not just that he would serve her, that she could serve him. When faced with new obstacles, she embraced the challenge knowing the Holy Spirit was walking alongside her, guiding her, suffering with her. And because she had accepted God's faith and his love, her faith just continued to grow. She accepted that this love was always with her. And she continually shares with her family that ever-present smile, that spirit of hope, and everyone around her. It was really faith in the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit's presence was with her every step of the way. Because you have seen my affliction, you have taken my adversities, and have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. Enemies of bullies, of cold, of disease, of feeling alone, of mental health struggles, of 
reminder of a frustrating community and world that we live in, abuses of children, that you have you've seen that affliction, Lord, and you come to us. And she would continue to pray, I trust in you, O oh God. I say, you are my God. So finally on that Saturday afternoon, as she says goodbye to her family, she leaves them the final testimony of faith. She says, thank you, God, for the life you've given me, for that life we just shared. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for the blessings in my life. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for being my companion on this life journey. Thank you, Lord, for the life you've given me. Even when it was hard, or tired, or cold, or hungry, or alone. And as Edna drifted to a more peaceful place that Saturday afternoon, I had no doubt in her heart was she was praying those words that she learned as a little girl. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, and faithful God. Now friends, all of us have those times when we feel cold or fully or alone. Even amid a wonderfully blessed life that we may have, we all get thrown those occasional curves. Times when our plan gets pushed off track, where that line, maybe even our faith a little bit, becomes blurred. Sometimes it may be hard to recognize that Holy Spirit around us, but the Lord's there. Friends, Jesus loves us, he suffers with us, and he forgives us. And all we have to do is what that confirmation class shared with me a couple weeks ago. Accept his love. Because when we accept his love through his forgiveness, he does become that rock of refuge for us, that strong fortress to save us. So on this Pentecost Sunday, as we celebrate the treasured gift God gave Mary and those first disciples, the ever presence of the Holy Spirit, let us remember that the Holy Spirit is there for us too every day. It might be in the form of laughing and shouting at a children's birthday party or a special event. Maybe it's in the form of a strong grandmother, a youth director at a community church, or a family is willing to take in teenagers who desperately need someone to care for them. And friends, maybe it's you. Stopping to say hello to that stranger who's got the sad look on their face at the grocery store. Reaching out to the neighbor who lost someone special recently. That's really hard, isn't it? Someone we know, they lose someone. But that little voice in your head and in your heart that keeps saying, I should call her, I need to call her, I need to reach out. Friends, that is the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit telling us, I am here for you, and I am here for you to reach out to that person because I need you to share with them Jesus Christ. So maybe a week later, but it's really appropriate. I want to say thank you for the gift of faith that my mom gave me. It's a gift she modeled in her daily life. Shared with her family as she said goodbye with a smile I can still remember. It's a gift of faith and the gift of the need to share that faith. Spreading the Holy Spirit with all those we encounter. The challenge we all have to open our eyes and see every moment is the Holy Spirit being there. So I say thank you, Mom, and thank you, God, for being there. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for walking among us to show the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you, Lord, for your suffering and your death by which we are reconciled with you. Thank you for the victory and the hope that comes from your resurrection. Thank you, God, for not leaving us alone, but for gifting us the Holy Spirit to journey with us every step of the way to help us to always be aware of your presence. Jesus, I trust in you as my Savior. I commit to follow you as my Lord. This I pray in your name. Amen. Friends, would you please stand with me as we affirm our faith together in the form of the Nicene Creed. We believe in the one God, Father of God, and Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten is not made of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, 
Friends, as we move through prayers of the people, I'll share a prayer with you, and we will end with in unity, saying the Lord's Prayer. Before I do, I'll uh, make sure there's a moment in there where you can pray and lift up people in your own heart, too, as you go through. You may not do that regularly, but it's something I always find really rewarding. So, when I pause, it's not that I'm going to pass out or something like that. <laughs> now, might be I lost my place, but that's okay. Um, but so we'll share that. So let me share this, this beautiful prayer with you. <clears throat> God who gathers us on this Pentecost Sunday in the season of the Spirit, in the first signs of summer, grant us the courage of a planted seed, poised to growth, ready to burst from the dark, rich soil of word and worship. May the timing of our growth coincide with your created order. May we bloom in righteousness as the sun rises high and the crops grow tall. Peaceful spirit in this season of war and violence as bombs fall and eight or fifteens are used to gun down innocent people and refugees as they flee their homes in search of safety. Save us from evil. Free us from your addiction to violence and weapons of destruction. Then the ark of the universe for justice. Inspire us with courage to resist the evil of racism, to proclaim, proclaim your inclusive love, and to root out the enemies of the righteous to persist for peace. Spirit of wisdom and understanding, as you gather diverse people of Pentecost, embolden us as a Christian hospitality that welcomes and receives all. Open our hearts to empathy and understanding of the circumstances of others. Empower us with your radical love that can strengthen and save. May we, your people, call on you with one voice, as one body, giving thanks and praise for your promise of redemption. Now, Lord, in silence, we lift up those names in our heart that we know need your loving arms around them. In your mercy, beloved Lord, hear the prayers of your people. Now, as the body of Christ, as we pray, as Christ taught his disciples to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and power, and the glory forever.
Let us pray. You have blessed each of us with gifts to serve and share, most generous God. May the offerings we present today be used to further your kingdom and build your beloved community. Amen. I got you. What's the box of annotations? You should be here, I think. <laughs> okay. Ready? Is it kind of start? So, friends, first of all, thank you very much for welcoming Lori and I back again. We appreciate it so much. It's so great to see some of your faces. Since we share a benediction, I'll share one more thing with you, and that is, who wants with all of us? Happy 
sad, celebrations, times of challenge he walks with all of us. But he also charges us to share him with other people. So understanding there are times we are all in need, just understanding there are times when we need to help somebody else too. Because that is the Holy Spirit, that voice in your mind, that, that urge in your heart that says do something, that too is the Holy Spirit. So may the spark of God ignite you, and the love of Christ renew you. May the Holy Spirit fill you on Pentecost Sunday and all the days to come. Amen.